and welcome to the SheClicks webinar. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of SheClicks. Now, before we get started, we have a word from our sponsor. This webinar is sponsored by Nikon, a world leading provider of imaging products and services. Nikon's regional director, Charlotte Kensley says, at Nikon, we pride ourselves on supporting photographers producing inspiring video and still imagery. We're honored to be partnering with SheClicks and share their ambition of increasing the visibility of women in all aspects of photography. So thank you very much. To Nikon. Okay, so well, that's enough from me. It's time to hear from our speaker tonight, Carolyn Mendelssohn, who is a fabulous portrait photographer and also an ambassador for both Nikon and the Royal Photographic Society. Hi, Carolyn, how are you? Hi, I'm really good. I'm really excited to be sharing these stories of mine today and hopefully to be inspiring um, other photographers or other people that love photography. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, it's really lovely to see you again. I think the last time I saw you had a glass of gin and tonic in your hand. No, um, no, no. It was my <laughs> doppelganger. It wasn't me. <laughs> okay. Well, over to you. Great. Yes. Yeah, so how to apply for a photography commission. Um, it's an interesting title, really. So this is some of my work. But yeah, there. just to start off, we have our title, but there isn't one way so this is my way this is the journey i've been on but there are many approaches um this is my way and this is about what i've done what i've learned and tips i've gathered on the way so hopefully you know i think there'll be all kinds of photographers here and hopefully you will be entertained at the very least and will gain some useful tips and information now what i have to do because i do go on is i'm going to put my timer on so that I don't run out of time. Um, so I'm going to share with you my journey from the very beginning through to becoming a portrait photographer and then a Nikon ambassador. And it is absolutely wonderful to kind of have the support of an organization like Nikon, who I think have um, really pushed the diversity of their ambassadors and their creators. So I'm very proud to be part of that. I'm going to talk to you about what I've learned step by step how I started to get and how I deal with commissions I'm going to talk through some of the different genres I'm not going to put all the genres I do in it but I'll, I'll select some of them my journey through them with some tips but please feel free to ask any questions um it would be great I'd be very happy to answer any of your questions so my story, um, some of you will have heard my story before, but I'm going to share a little bit of it before. Again, um, I um, didn't plan on being a photographer ever. That, so this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to work on stage. I wanted to work in film. I wanted to perform. I wanted to direct. And actually, that's the path I took um, to the point of doing using film, becoming a filmmaker, and then creating big site-specific projections, but always with the heart in the drama and the narrative. So why didn't I continue to do that? This is why. Um, I had three kids, which is wonderful. So Oscar, the oldest, who looks grumpy there, he did used to come with me when I was working in theatre, but then I realized with three children, I couldn't really have that kind of career. And I felt a real sense of um, loss of identity. I had been so used to having the life of a creator and I didn't know how to do that anymore until my husband bought me a Nikon, which I ignored because I always ignore things like that. And I put it under my bed and I didn't want to be a photographer. And then one day I picked it up and it was a huge epiphany to me. And I realized that I could be creative. I could tell stories with a stills camera. So it all started in 2007. And you know what? I absolutely loved using photography really creatively. So I used textures, I, they're my kids that I, I utilized everything really. My kids, I went on a trip to Africa and told my stories. So these are three very different images, obviously entirely different to the kind of work I do now, but it, for me, it was playful and I absolutely loved it. And I felt this joy that you feel when you discover a new art form. 
and there's um, Oscar and Sam and, their, and Oscar's grandmother. So um, I always think growing as a photographer before you even start applying, taking on commissions, get out of your comfort zone, learn to make mistakes and be open to failure, be playful and enjoy the things that you love to photograph. Um, right, so I'm gonna tell you about the honest truth. When I started, I was totally reliant on auto on my camera. Absolutely, I didn't know how to use my camera. I was reliant on auto. I used lots of textures. I played with Photoshop. So I was kind of creating pictures really, rather than photographs, I used layers. But I wanted to tell stories with those, with those pictures. And I was having a whole lot of fun. And this was 2007. And I also joined Flickr, which probably isn't so active now. Um, but I got a big following and it was wonderful. There was a sense of community there and then I entered a competition. So let's call this commission or application number one. I'll call it a commission. Um, on Flickr, there was a call out between Channel 4 and Flickr saying they were looking for the best emerging digital photographers. And being very naive, I thought, oh, I will apply for that. So I sent in a few photographs I sent in some of my textured pictures some portraits and just I did it just a few hours before the closing date I didn't overthink it um I then got sh shortlisted amongst 300 people and had to go to London and had to uh put a portfolio together and speak to the producers and do all these workshop things but I was busy hiding behind everyone because I thought I'd be found out being the person that didn't know how to use their camera properly. Um, I then got to the final 12 and then I got to the, well, you'll find out. Let me share with you. I'm going to share with you the trailer. In Britain, a photo is taken every 10 seconds and 12 million of us own digital cameras. But what does it take to be a top photographer? photographer has the ability to connect with the subject matter that they're depicting. You have to get to know it, you have to understand it, you have to be passionate about it, and also tell us something about your relationship to that subject. Thousands of you submitted your photos via the Channel 4 website for the chance to take part in this unique photographic competition. We chose the six most talented photographers to go head-to-head -head over a series of challenging assignments. I've got a nice little scene happening here. It's that feeling that you get when you take a shot. Yeah. Up for grabs for the winner, an exhibition at a top gallery and a book deal worth thousands. Exhibiting in the National Gallery would be a dream come true. Each week a panel of top industry experts will judge their work to see if they've got the talent to succeed as a pro. It doesn't work visually because we don't know really quite what it's about. Yeah, I do think this is really a fantastic portrait because it plays with vulnerability and strength. The background is over romanticised and over fiddly. I think you'll be incredibly harsh. Coming up. The photographers have a face-off with a celebrity. I seem quite nice, you do I? do. Oh, I can also be quite nasty. A day at the beach turns into a nightmare. This is hell. <laughs> this is absolute hell. And two photographers are removed from the competition. So it's been a great regret that we have to let you go tonight. So, guess who was let go? Let's find out. I don't think it would be very hard to see that actually as um, as a photographer with very little experience, uh, that person was me <laughs> and Jay. And ironically, um, we are the ones who are now still making a successful living as a photographer. So I really, really went out of my comfort zone. I did actually take a portrait of Jermaine Greer, um, having never used the studio before, and that the portrait of her I still have in my portfolio, and it's very much the kind of way I work now. Um, so my first steps after picture this, it was a, a kind of prime time Channel 4 program, and it was very popular, but I felt that I had kind of been a little misrepresented. So, but this was how my photography really began. And um, my drive at that point was to prove I could do it. 
and learn my craft. And at that point, I was still at home with small children. And so I focused on my family and portraiture. So, you know, I started from home. And that's how, you know, we're looking at how did I start getting commissions? Well, I shared that work. Obviously, I'd had the huge publicity of Picture This at the time. Um, uh, and I was on Flickr, and then now I use other forms of social media. So what was my dream at that point? Well, it was to learn my craft, to learn how to use my camera in order to create powerful portraits, in order to create stories, to tell the stories and explore the world that we live in. And I started to be seen as a lifestyle photographer. That wasn't really my plan, um, but the work I was showing involved the people I knew, my family, and um, where I was sharing it got the work seen and taking photographs and portraits of my family was how I honed my craft. So these are some of those images really early on as a photographer. So this was probably, I'd only been really taking, taking portraits and photographs for, for a year at this point, but I was incredibly obsessed and I wanted to push my, my practice and my craft at that point. Um, and this work got seen and this work got picked up and this work sometimes I get up because I was sharing it on social media, which was Flickr at the time, I would get um, contacted by big organizations, uh, whether they could use, whether they could purchase or buy the rights to, to photographs. Um, as you can see, it was always about story. So I used what I had to um, really create a document, a family document. I call it the family document now. And some of this work led on to successes. So this led to winning Lifestyle Photography Awards. It led to book covers. It led to um, really putting together a website, um, showing my work online. So the first step I'd say is, Put a, put a web, share your, share your work on Instagram, curate it, put portfolios together, put a website together. Think of it as a portfolio, show the work you want to get commissioned to do, organize it on your website. Um, but also remember a lifestyle family photography website is very different to an editorial style website. I have two. So that's kind of starting point at that point when my work, when I started to be contacted, and this is really via Flickr, by big companies or people that were publishing books to use my work, I realized that I needed to have a website. So this led to being invited to doing lifestyle commissions, private and commercial ones. So let me give you an example of the very first commission I got. I didn't know what I was doing. I was absolutely terrified. It was a family on the moors. What I, um, so it was a kind of private commission and all I could think of was like, I needed to create these stories of this family of these children on the moorlands. And that was really the very first job that I got. I didn't even really know or understand how to charge for it. Um, and then it went on to other other commissions. And you can see that there is a kind of signature to the content of the work. So the, the lifestyle commission, and this is on my website, this is a, a private commission generally. So I'm going to go through private commissions and, and corporate commissions and commercial commissions and artistic commissions. But my commission process and it is a process goes like this. I get contacted, and this is usually via my website or Instagram. Um, I then, it can be by phone or email or message. I then organize a face-to-face -face or Zoom meeting. It used to be face-to-face. -face. Um, uh, and in that Zoom meeting, I'm having an in-depth consultation, a questionnaire um, where I'm really looking at what they are wanting from me being their photographer what kind of what's their dream what do they what would they love their portraits to look like and we arrange a location and a shoot date i then do always do a recce if i can to to, to find the location to 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 the location to look for a good area um, and the photo shoots generally about one and a half to three hours in length 
Um, I, I advise them about their what clothes they should wear. And then I, I tell them they're going to get 20 to 40 photographs edited and displayed on a private web page, usually about two weeks after a shoot uh, but for, for these kind of private commissions. And then the opportunity of having uh, viewing a selection of products in the comfort of their home or in my studio, and then they receive the products. So that's a very different process. So um, here we have it again. So this is kind of work I was doing, and I was always trying to create work that was impactful, that was beautiful, that was compelling. Um, I needed to make it interesting for myself and for them. So it could be, so the locations really differed. So this is a near Formby, this is in Yorkshire. Um, so I think within these kind of commissions, you start to incorporate your own style if it fits with the client's request. I always wanted to do things that were kind of my signature really um, about telling the story of, of them. And it, in turn, you start to do that to shape the kind of work you get permission to do. So for example, I shared my family documents and then I, we used to go to the Isles of Scilly and then I got contacted by, and this is because I shared it on Instagram by, um, Wolf Rock, a mar marketing company, to create work and tell the story and have that work in their brochure. So that was my first start of a commercial commission. So these are all pictures of my family. So that wasn't too difficult for me because obviously I was documenting that work. Um, sometimes I'll get a commissioned portrait shoot and I think about how, you know, and it would turn into something entirely different. So we have Caroline here, and this was just a private shoot. She was 17. And this um, was a, a, a kind of portrait shoot for her 17th birthday. It was really freezing and cold. And she was so cold that after this picture, which I actually really love, I said, do you want to stop? Because she was shaking and she said, yes. And we rescheduled it. And I asked her whether she was interested in doing more fashion based, um, fashion based sort of portraits. And obviously this was also talking to her parents who were paying for this for her. And so I then started to incorporate fashion based work. So this is the same girl, but we we sourced clothing. It was a different location and it was May rather than January. Um, but this work then got shared and then this work then started to get me fashion, fashion commissions. So what you need to think about when you're communicating with people or when you're putting things on your website or when you're sharing things on a story is who are you communicating to? Who would you like to read it? So you tailor your copy, you tailor your words to the audience you want. So um, if you're like editorial or documentary photographer, you're writing in a different way to if you're doing a kind of just family photography. Um, think about those people when you're writing the copy that you're sharing. So the journey continues. And on the way, I was always asked to do weddings. So the weddings, portraits, commission process. I would always say I don't do weddings because I don't do weddings. The very thought of doing a wedding would absolutely terrify me. But one day I put a little post up. I don't do weddings, but I do do elopements. And that day, as soon as I put that up, I got a response. It was a Valentine's posting. So this was really, again, on social media. You know, I've often been approached and asked whether I do weddings. And my answer is no, but let me into a secret. I don't do weddings, but shh, I do do elopements. So um, it was my way of, of really thinking, actually, what would I like to, if I don't want to do weddings, what would elopements be like? That's telling a story. So I sent this out and they instantly got back to me. And that private commission was, um, and then I shared this and I shared the kind of products I'd create for these little packages. So this is very different to what I do now, but it was still about creating, this was a couple, um, Annabelle and Laura, who eloped to Whitby. And how perfect is that? So I shared that experience of going to Whitby with them. Um, and then I um, 
I shared that story and, and I got a few more elements, but it was never really an area that I was going to go into, but the actual, but this was a really beautiful thing to be involved in. So other examples of lifestyle and portrait commissions, so baby lifestyle stories, and I'm always keeping the same process. So um, interestingly, I was contacted by um, a woman from America who was producer for, I think it's Orange is, uh, is the New Black or something like that. And these were friends of hers in London. And she had found my work and was interested in me in working with them and their new baby. So for me, I needed to be very clear and understand how, where we were going to be, the kind of work I did and the sort of images that they wanted. So it's very simple, documentary, kind of very gentle work. And then headshots. Again, it's the same process. So I do a lot of a lot of headshots work. So somebody says I'm interested in having personal branding or headshots. I then share work with them and I then array, I then meet them and we talk about. So it's pretty a much longer process than other people. We talk about the kind of images that they want. And then we move on to work that I, I kind of started to really enjoy. So this is personal branding work which has a kind of commercial feel, it's cutting edge arts company. So with this kind of commission, they contacted me. They wanted images of themselves, websites, press, publicity and headshots. So I go through the process in the same way. I meet them. We, we look at the kind of um, what they would love to get. And they were very much wanted it to feel the, the urban location they were based in. Um, we talked about the uh, we talked about the process, the licensing agreement for the images I, I was going to share with them. And we did a recce day together to find locations to represent that represented the city. We created a mood board, so that's all. And this is also transferable to commercial commissions as well. A mood board, which kind of really looked at the feel for that work. And then on the shoot day, we timetabled it with breaks and time for hair and makeup at the beginning and then for this kind of work it's not product it the delivery of photographs and digital on the website to make them downloadable so um something i still do now is telling artist stories and this is kind of commission that i absolutely adore so it's the same process and this work sometimes used on in the covers of of books or magazines and their websites so for me it's just a lovely morning or afternoon with that artist telling their story of of their work so i'm going to give you an example a very different kind of of example of a corporate company a commission so this um was a PR company, they wanted a rebrand and they found me, they found my website, they um, sent me an email, I had a phone call from them and I put together a brief, a really complex brief, like a PDF. Um, so how do, I'm sure people wanting to know how they find me, well, well people search, so they search Instagram, they search websites um, and they're looking at the kind of work you share. So I put together a brief and then I felt it was really essential we had a consultation. So this is the brief I put together. So um, I, we talked on the phone, I researched the company and then I put that PDF together. And the PDF had examples of my work that I thought was appropriate and then had rates and licensing. This is very, this is actually on separate pages. It looks very cluttered here. So it was a response to their photography request and who am I, the clients I've worked with, um, why me? And um, then it, I, it was a response to that request. I felt that their style um, fitted my their request fitted my my kind of style and essence of my photography and then the kind of questions I wanted to know um they wanted headshots they wanted stuff for their website um and they wanted team shots so I shared the kind of work I did so they'd be very clear the, of, of the sort of location work I've done and the portrait work I've done so after the meeting we worked out exactly what we needed for the day and who would be responsible from their side for the coordination because that's really important on these bigger projects it was a bit cheeky of them because i said a day costs this and this will get you that but they made it into one day of two mornings 
and in reality it's still two days work so probably with hindsight I would have um kind of made sure they understood it was two day two days not two mornings so these were the kind of images that 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 I created um I then let's look at the portraits commission process for artists musicians and writers because obviously that's something I, I really love to do I love to share their stories and I get more artists and musicians and writers approaching me to work with them on album covers and personal branding so the process is still important when you're doing this kind of work, the phone call, the consultation, the Zoom meeting or the face-to-face, -face, and then an in-depth consultation to explore what they would like. And this is my process. I know everybody else will do it very differently. And we arrange a shoot date and a recce. And then I always give some kind of wardrobe advice too. So Alice was on location. These are very editorial shots of Alice Fox, who is a textile artist, um, and she grows on her allotment and uses this within her artwork. And then this has become part, this is then, she then uses these as marketing and it's in magazines and books that she writes. So um, when portraits and headshots are used in books and magazines, that's a step on. So uh, Rowan, who I know well, uh, wanted me to take some pictures of her, so I did. And then these were used in magazines. And then she, she did a project with Cara, Cara Delevingne. So Rowan's a writer um, and writes amazing, amazing novels. She, was, uh, a, she wasn't really a ghostwriter, she was a co-writer with Cara Delevingne, who's an actor and a model and uh, wrote this called Mirror Mirror, interestingly. Her picture was used in the books as the co-writer, and then every time it was published in a different country, the publishing company would get in touch with me, and they would say, how much do we need to pay you to release this picture for the release to use it? So every time this kind of picture is shown, in a, published by a different company or, or, or shown in a different country or published in a different country, then you get a new license in agreement so this kind of works quite nice it might not be lucrative to start off with but then suddenly you're having lots of different publishers wanting permission and a license which they pay for um Sarah Beth Briggs is a classical pianist and so I did this on location uh shoot with her so again same process but this was for her album cover um, and I spent a whole day with her doing lots of different kind of pictures and she's been using these pictures for her albums and for her marketing and for her website so on this kind of thing I'll bring in a, a makeup artist but I'll have a uh, half a day with with Sarah before we even start doing this just to really pin down because you don't want to do all this sort of um this commission and do the wrong work it's such a waste for them as well um yeah and so this is an album cover on location done years ago uh by union jill it was used as an album cover and and they wanted me to do something like at the work i used to do back in the day so it was quite a playful shoot called it was crow mother the album was called so you know obviously i played i used photoshop and I played around with it, but actually that was quite a joyful, fun thing for me to do. And to go back to the things that I was trying to iron out of my work was, was quite ironic. So how do they find me? They find you if you share the kind of work you want to do more of. So don't share weddings if you don't want to do weddings. Don't share dogs if you don't want to do dogs. If you want to do documentary work, share documentary work. So. Um, so part of this journey on the way, I moved from lifestyle commissions, which I don't really do anymore, through to commercial, editorial, and develop my own artistic work, which was always really important to me. It's the editorial portraits, stories, and commission process. On this way, on the way, I started to be contacted by magazine and picture editors. Now, when I say this, it seems really bizarre because I remember back to when I first picked that camera up and the journey has been really interesting. So how did they find me? Well, they saw my work online. They saw my website. They would be searching. It might be a magazine and they're searching for Northern Photographer. <laughs> That's often how it is. I get a phone call and they'd say, um, we're a magazine. Uh, we do this kind of work. Uh, we 
see that you live in the north. Uh, this is happening in the north. Are you interested? Um, so that's quite interesting. They chose me because they like the work, but also because of my location. Otherwise, they would send their London-based photographers up there. Um, so when you when you get a contact like this, communication is really important. You need to understand the brief. Is it a portrait they want or is it a story? Um, that's really important. What do they feel is important to come across? You write down a list of questions you want to ask, like, where's the location? Is there a team? Do you want me to put a team together? Do you, um, do I may need an assistant? Um, have you got the budget for that? Or can somebody from your team work with me? So doing a recce is really important. Doing research is really important. Particularly if you start like me, every job I do, I have a certain amount of fear because I want it to be great. So I do a lot of research. Understanding how the work is going to be used is important. Is it going to be a front cover? Is it going to be a story in that magazine? So um, here, this is a magazine editorial, and this was like a series of stories. It was in the north. Their picture editor was calling me from the south of England saying, can you send me the pictures on your phone? I went, no, I can't. I couldn't. So I had to be very straight. I said, you're going to have to trust me to do this. There are young children involved. I had a makeup artist and an assistant on this. And it was really nerve wracking because it was super bright day. It was high pressure. It was an editorial and I was trying to be very calm about it. I had to find that shade to take this work because it was like midday. I remember when they said, oh, we meet you at 11 o'clock. My heart sank on a bright summer's day. So you need to kind of use all the things that you understand and know as a photographer to make this kind of thing work. Lacuna magazine. So um, they contacted me again because they found my work and they saw that I lived in um, the area and they said, we want to do a piece on the Rohingya community. And this is something I was really interested in. So I was very keen. It was kind of documentary and portraits for this article. So I then spent a day with this um, amazing group of people and took portraits. I, I couldn't plan them too much because it was literally a case of just going there and they were lovely and their story was very powerful. Um, so that went off. So all these things were happening because they found me. So how do people know what I do and how and why do they contact me? Well, let's recap. So step by step, you create your work, you select what you show, if you want to get a commission to take wedding photos, show wedding photos. If you want to get commissions for editorials or portraits, show this style of work or, per, or show personal projects. So women photograph is for um, photojournalists and I apply. It's an international photojournalist website. I apply to be on their website, not because I'm a photojournalist, but because my work tells stories. I'm a portrait photographer. They accepted me, but I'll tell you what happened because they accepted me. So Bloomberg, Bloomberg, me and Bloomberg, it's ridiculous. How did they find me? So I work as a freelance photographer for Bloomberg. They called me when I was in the hairdresser. I saw this number come up on my phone. I thought, oh, I never answer my phone if I don't recognize the number. But then they left this Maria, who's the picture editor there, left a really lovely message. So I called them back. And I asked, how did you find me? You know, thinking maybe they're just looking for, you know, somebody in the location. She said, we find we found you on women photographs. So they were headhunting for, I think at this point, it was for photographers who were, who were Northern, actually. They have lots of London photographers. They're international. But they wanted to find some really great storytellers, women as well. They're very good with women who live in the North. Um, so that's why they were interested. They really liked my work. So I was taken aback um, and they were very supportive. So why did I try to put them off? I did. I was like going, oh, I don't think I could do this. I can't. I can't kind of. Um, I said to Maria, I have to be honest with you. I can't do a job the next day. I'm really busy. She said, we will work around you. And often they do ring up and say, there's a job tomorrow we'd like you to do, take a picture of this MP or a portrait of this celebrity or, and often can't do it, but then they often do reschedule. So this is Pogba. They rang me and said, we'd like you to take a picture of Paul Pogba. 
I said, oh, I'm too busy, partly because I was terrified. And then I had people saying to me, you can't, you can't say no to Pogba. I didn't even really know who Pogba was, but he, he is actually one of the most famous photographers. So um, not photographers, footballers. He's one of the most famous footballers. So this is me. Um, Pogba was super tall. I didn't get a chance to recce. It was at Manchester United. I was told things like you can't use anything that looks like Manchester United. So I then had to, so I was told what I couldn't do by people that worked at Manchester United. And I had to be very calm and find little locations. But this, let me just show you, this is what I look like. I look, I'm short, I hold my camera. Um, and this is what it's like. And there's brilliant Pogba. Let's see this one. And then move your eyes up, great. And I think we could do a little bit. So, you know, I always bring a step ladder with me on these shoots because I'm sure he was like six foot four, but I thought, okay, we'll go for a fashion look here because he's so tall. So I take a picture from, from behind and he was brilliant. So these were the pictures of Pogba. They were take, they were shown, they're, they're everywhere, these pictures. So Bloomberg then send these pictures out. Um, and I'm actually, and they loved them. And I'm really quite proud of them because I felt I could take a different kind of picture of a, of a footballer. So this was way out of my comfort zone. So are personal projects important? I have to say, if I wasn't doing, if I hadn't done a lot of personal work, I would not be getting these kind of commissions. This is why that I get approached. So that personal project, the family documents. The family document is really photos I've taken of my family over the years, but they're very documentary style and compelling. They're the ones I took right at the beginning through to ones I take now. Keepers is a little project I'll share with you, which is shopkeepers in, in Hexham I took years ago. And um, I just was very intrigued and I was doing a, a making a little film there and I wanted to take pictures of independent traders because they intrigued me and it was a personal project. And then being in between, which is the work I'm best known for. And this is like the family story in the document. I learned through doing these. That's my dad who now sadly is very, um, it's kind of living with dementia now. That's my son, Oscar. My kids do get involved in my work and that's my dad later on. So I'm kind of, the, the family document also trains me to do other work. So this personal work becomes commissioned work. So Haslington Lodge was working in a care home with people living with dementia. There were challenges like the room was they, I was taking portraits of the people with their families, people living with dementia. The setting um, was a very plain, brightly lit beige colored room. And I remember thinking, how am I going to take this picture? How am I going to take these portraits? Um, this is really important, they have dignity. So I'm learning all the time. And what I did was in this bright room, I got the care worker to attach, to find a dark blanket we could attach to um, a wardrobe. And I closed, I thought about the light of Oscar here. I thought I kind of want to get that lighting. So this very brightly opened blind, I shut until um, it was almost close. A tiny bit of light was coming through. And these were the images, some of the images that I took within, you know, I had 15 minutes with each person, but I wanted it to be calm and peaceful and for them to have agency within that work. So this is kind of commissioned work, but also work that I'm very passionate about. So how did my artistic and personal work become what I'm commissioned to create? So like I was saying, these, this is keepers. I'm going to rush through keepers here. This was done like in 2010. And then I shared this work, keep, uh, kind of tra tradesmen and craftsmen in, in um, Hexham. And then I got commissioned to then come back two years later and take more. And this was then exhibited. So this became commission. Being in between was based on my memories of being, this is like a huge project, took me six years to complete, based on my memories of being this age. This wasn't this wasn't a commission, it was personal work. I created portraits of girls between 10 to 12 and asked them about their lives. I wanted them to be as if they could be in, in like art galleries, to have importance, to 
hear what they're saying to art to to get them to have the choice of the clothes they were going to wear so 90 portraits of just five years it was over six years this um won some major competitions so enter competitions as well select your best work enter competitions so um it was widely publicized it became a book which nikon did help sponsor which was wonderful by blue um, published by blue coat press and then it it won various awards it's currently that there is an exhibition going on with this work in um hexham so this is a work of that i'm very passionate about that took me forever that i did in my own time but actually led to most extraordinary things there's the um that's impressions gallery and then it was shown on the streets so this was highly publicized all over buzzfeed huffington post a photo monitor the bbc the guardian channel five um so you know getting if you're doing personal work this is just a quick tip how do you get that work out there media press pr put together a list of picture editors this is like slightly a sidetrack journalists magazines websites that you're interested in or that link to your work research who you think might make a good contact then put a pdf together of your project don't make it too long include lots of white space have a short biog project description curate a small selection of photographs the pdf can be tweaked i use keynote and then convert to pdf and then write a personalized cover email and send it off don't worry if you don't hear back these people these picture editors journalists magazines websites they get so much stuff so don't be offended if you get nothing back i have to say when it got into the guardian i sent three mess three emails with this work and i said um to matt who's a picture editor for the online uh, guardian i said last chance was in my title line and i was like what have i done and then he went no no we're interested so yeah just get them out there it's the artist commission process so i've done book covers women's canteen at phoenix works generations portraits of holocaust survivors born in bradford hardy and free that i'm current currently working on so how to plan when you get asked to do a job and sent the brief you research I storyboard always storyboard because I'm trying to think of different ideas I prep my equipment this is a women's canteen at Phoenix works by Flora Lyons and I was asked to reimagine it I said yes and then I was terrified because I thought I only do portraits and then I remembered I also also did theatre and I looked at this as a tableau and it was creating a contemporary version of this work this is how I felt this is what happened so you can see these are ordinary people I've working with an assistant with lots of lights I'd never done this kind of work before um, and then this was the the reimagining and became I entered these into competitions as well became a portrait of Britain winner and it was shown everywhere so it was brilliant for those people in this picture giving them a real sense of importance so generations which is a research currently in, Ma in Manchester Imperial War Museum um, I was asked to become one of the photographers to take pictures of portraits of Holocaust survivors and their families it was a, an exhibition with big names from the Royal Photographic Society and I was thinking how and why did I get it well I'd already kind of done a few commissions like 209 women women MPs um, I was known for my personal work I was a member of the RPS and and then I started to I I, I then thought this is a really interesting thing to be involved in so Hanukkah um, was the youngest Hanukkah was 78 was from Holland and was a child born in hiding so this is a selection of pictures I had a long chat with her first I went and I went on location to her house I I looked at how we could tell her story and then um, what would work the best so I went through all of these and in the end chose this picture here which I will share Rosal and Leslie so these are, are, are um, Les, Leslie Rosal was from Vienna and had to escape as a 13 year old this is so as you can see I'm taking lots of different kinds of pictures but I they weren't powerful to me until 
I um, took the one on the right where she's sitting there and the light is beautiful and her daughter Leslie is looking at the picture of her aunt who her grandmother who was murdered in Auschwitz and her face who she never met and her face was reflected and Hanukkah there on the left is holding a picture of her um her mother and her as a newborn so um these are shown these were shown at the Imperial War Museum UNESCO, Piccadilly Circus, Royal Photographic Society, and currently at the Imperial War Museum North. So this, when I think about this, it's quite incredible, really. When I think I started on that television program as a new photographer and was kind of basically told, no, no, don't do things your way, but always push yourself further. You know, you, there, this is a long journey. So uh, 2007, 2006. So it's like we're talking about 16 years of photography. Um, can personal work lead into commission? Well, I'm artist in Bradford for um, my artist in residence were born in Bradford, and I've been invited to work with them over six years. And I got contacted because of being in between. They saw that work and they said, "Could you work with us?" So I put a PDF together of how I may approach the residency. I won't show you that PDF, but it, it was really an example of my work and my practice and how I may approach that and so um, this is the work I'm doing it's kind of very reflective of being in between but this is a wonderfully a brilliant thing to be involved in I'm paid as artists and residents I get to meet these amazing young people I take their portraits and then um, that sometimes gets exhibited or published they're very much part of it so let's let's overrun a bit and that's this is my behind the scene so yeah I cart everything with me I have a studio now but I cart all those things with me and there's some more recent pictures so I'm I'm following these young people they're 12 to 14 every year 25 of them for the next seven years which is a long time taking their portrait every year and asking them about interviewing them about their lives so currently working on um, an amazing commission. It was a public art commission, Bronte Parsonage Museum. They did a call out. They um, said they want a photographer who can do audio. And um, they then said, we would like uh, audio, women in landscape, stories. They want a statement of interest. So I sent them a statement of interest why I should do it why I felt it was the project for me. And they attracted people from all over the country. The work is being exhibited at the Parsonage, Bronte Parsonage. Um, so that was, this was my statement of, of interest. So basically I talked about the kind of work I had done, why I was um, inspired by the commission and how I wanted as an artist to go on a journey with women, a real variety of women, so they would take me on a place that's special to them um, and that it would be somewhere that I could discover and they would then tell me the stories behind them. So this work is opening on May the 4th. So I had to do call outs, I had to find people. I got, I got the commission, which was fantastic, so exciting. Um, I wanted stories and variety, and I was also using sound. So I'm just going to share a, a picture from this, the wild swimmers. So I made an error of saying any wild swimmers out there, everybody's a wild swimmer. Then I thought I need wild swimmers with stories. And then I got an email from this woman saying, we swim every full moon, a group of women between... Um, 35 and 80, we meet on a full moon and we take our clothes off and we go swimming. And I was thinking, that's hardy and free. And I treated this in a much more creative way. I didn't know what I was going to get, whether I'd get anything. I was just responding to it. And this is the picture. And there is a little bit of audio, but this is one, Every this is one moon, of the pictures. I get together with a group of women and we're called the Au Naturel So oh, I record their story. So we're au naturel because we go in the water without a swimming costume. We don't wear wetsuits, we wear bobble hats, little boots and swimming gloves. We all go together, usually in the dark, to a moonlit reservoir or river or lake and immerse ourselves in water, naked, and then we generally have a little bit of food 
and a, perhaps a fire and we sing and it's just a complete contrast to modern life. So there is a beautiful song that goes with it. I didn't play all the audio. So I'm, I'm creating a projection of um, this series of work. So here is some of the work from um, a theatre director who took me to the place that she spent so many years as a child, making dens, creating, um, creating her own stories. It's Evie Manning. I've got a journalist who took me to this amazing location, a folly in, in uh, I think, was it Rawdon? And then um, an, um, a wonderful woman who goes uh, long distance running. And then a rapper, a young musician who lived in inner city Bradford and then had to move to um, Harden, I think. And then she found this waterfall and found a sense of peace when she'd been through a very challenging time. So there are all lots of many different stories. This has been a joy as an artist to create this work. Um, I felt like I've been on this adventure. It's helped me get through January. I've been on these adventures with all these incredible women and heard their stories and recorded their stories. And it's been very special. So that is an example of an artistic commission. So let's recap. So show the kind of work you want to do. Separate your commercial and commissioned work if you do it from your personal work on your website. Personal work and projects can lead to interesting commissions if you share that work. Research, research, research. Always research when you get approached, research. If you are pro or approached or see a call out, this is probably for artistic work, put PDFs together to respond to the brief. It actually can be for commercial works as well. Make it easy to read, show relevant work and suggest treatments. Budgeting and licensing is another whole talk, which probably maybe we should have at another time. The Association of Photographers calendar is useful. I don't have an agent or representation, though my work is in galleries, but this can help with big commercial projects. It's very hard to get agents, but they sort everything out for you. There is an agent called, so there's Lucid Rep, there's Morgan Lockyer. So these are use, useful to see. Lisa Pritchard does pop up work for freelancers. So when I'm doing a big, if, if I was doing a big commercial work, I might contact her and then commission them to be my agent for that project. And they are really helpful. Do you remember this lot from the beginning? So these were the lot who I had a full on life. These were the lot who um, made me pick up a camera because I was no longer creative. This is them now. <laughs> so that I've involved them in this process. So it is unbelievable, really, when we go back to that to see what they become. But they have also been my assistants, been my subjects, been my muses, helped me on my journey and been incredibly patient. So whilst you're on your journey, be brave, take risks, be foolish, ignore the naysayers, be prepared, be kind, be authentic, listen and also be heard. Feel, feel the fear, I feel it all the time. Take a chance. What have you got to lose? And do come along to the new exhibition at the Bronte Parsonage or to see being in between at the moment in County, Dur in, in County Durham at Bishop Auckland Town Hall or the Imperial War Museum. That's where you can see my work at the moment. Um, these are my socials and my websites. And um, I, any questions, I'd be really delighted. So I'm going to stop the share because I've gone on as I normally do. So thank you for listening. That was fantastic. Thank you. We have lots of questions. Wow. <laughs> so let's get going because we need to uh, get through them. So um, do you think that with the constant expansion of social media and the greater accessibility of cameras and camera phones, that it's become harder for new photographers to enter the market today than it was when you first started out? Do you know, it's such an interesting question because I didn't have a photography training. So I think I don't know whether it's harder. I think in some ways people are really visually educated now. And if you want to um, be seen, then you have to put the work in 
you have to show your work you have to be tenacious you have to have a thick skin i've actually got really thin skin but i'm very resilient so um i think i don't think it's harder i think what becomes hard is when we see new technology like ai that scares all of it well it scares me but obviously if you're doing documentary work then ai doesn't really fit in um so I think you have more opportunities to show your work. It's just picking what social media you're going to use. It's going to photography festivals. Photo North is in Leeds. That's a good one. It's entering competitions. You have to just be in it for the long haul. Find mentors as well, but be in it for the long haul. It doesn't happen overnight. And sometimes I think we feel that it, it why, why is no one seeing me? I never expected anyone to see me. So I've always been pleasantly surprised when people have, but I've just been very driven to telling stories. And also, I mean, you mentioned you, when those call outs come, you answer, you apply. I you know, do. They don't necessarily, they're not necessarily going to knock on your door. Some you're very lucky. Sometimes they do, but they don't always knock on your door. It might be a general call out and you need to be connected to those places where you'll see those call outs. Absolutely. And I do apply and particularly like hardy and free. I was like, well, that would be so exciting. So that really did excite me. And I did apply. I wasn't expecting to be shortlisted and I wasn't expecting to get it. But I did as you know, I thought, well, I'm going to apply because if I don't apply, no one's they're not even going to look at me. So um, so I think you yeah, sometimes I'm asked to do things and I'm terrified. But I still do them and you learn if you do things which are slightly bigger than yourself, you learn and hopefully you have a great result. Something that occurred to me when you were talking, because that was the first question that came up. So I was sort of thinking about it. And one of the things that occurred to me as you were talking is a lot of your work. It's um, there are like projects or some of them are commissions and some of them are personal projects, but they are projects. They're not sporadic images of, of random things you know you've you've thought right I'm going to document you know our life or I'm going to document this holiday or I'm going to document this um and you know it uh, being in between that was a very specific project that you had to put the effort into to make it cohesive which is something you need to do with your commission work and people would look at that and think well you can obviously do that kind of thing Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's funny, the family document. So I call it the family document now because I, I realise that a lot of photographers have um, are now showing work based and these are artists showing work based on their families. I thought, actually, that's what I've been doing over the years. I've been documenting them. So it's become a new it's I be, it became it became a body of work. So I was doing it initially because I was practicing and I was obsessed with photography and I was getting the family involved in it but I think things like being in between it takes so much kind of effort to do a long project like that and there are times where you want to give up but I was lucky enough to have people that supported me and said don't give up ignore the naysayers that's why I said at the end my little quote from me is ignore those little voices in your head. If you're really passionate about something, just plod your way through it. Even if there's a, like two or three months where you're not doing it, it's not the end. You might get bored of it, but then you have a break and then you go back to it. Okay, right. We better crack on because we have lots more questions coming in. How do you approach the licensing process? Do you allow use of your photographs over a set time? Yeah, it's so complicated. Honestly, it's like all this stuff is a huge learning curve. So I had to research when I was asked about using stuff for book covers. And I'm a member of the Association of Photographers and they're really helpful when it comes to licensing. So I tend to put in these are to be used if it's like a book cover or, or something like that. These are to be used for this purpose over this period of time in these countries. Um, and the, the fee will be this. But I have asked and asked friends and um looked at the photography community and I've learned that way and I think sometimes it really helps to have an agent when you're doing that kind of thing but I have to I think associate photographers those kind of professional bodies are really useful and they have like a calculator where you can work out how much the licensing should be ideally okay 
We have a couple of connected questions, slightly tenuous, but when you shoot on location, do you ask permission from the locations and how do you scope and arrange the relevant locations for your shoots? So, yeah, I do. Um, if it's something which is like an editorial, then you do need permission if it's in a public place. And so therefore, generally, I will ask the person that's wanting me to do that work to sometimes they'll have somebody on their team to make sure that everybody knows you, you have to find out whether you need a license to take that picture permissions. When I'm doing like a, if it was like back in the day, if I was doing a family portrait, I wouldn't generally, but I think you do now. It depends where you go. Um, I think it's always helpful to say, can I take, can I be here for an hour taking pictures? Obviously, it's, it's an isolated place. It's not so bad, but generally you need kind of permissions to do it. So I can't remember. Well, there are two questions. Yeah. Uh, so on, on a connected note, um, earlier in your uh, webinar, you mentioned uh, you shared a lovely image of a teenage girl that you had to rearrange because she was so cold. Yes. In the second image, she's reclining in some bluebells, and they're just wondering whether you confirm whether that was private land. It was actually, and this was a long time ago, it was by my home. Mm -hmm. So, yes, by my home, but I'm very aware of the rules for bluebells. So, it's making sure you don't destroy them and you know so yes okay that's good to know uh, where do you shoot your headshots at a rented studio or do you have set up at home or do you go to the clients so there's two ways of doing it what I have done is I've taken you know like with being in between I had to cut all my equipment I take my lights I take my backdrop I take my paper reels so it could be to a client's house or I find a space to use or I have my studio now so people can come here for them. Often I find taking it to a client's house can work really well if they are wanting personal branding and it's something about them and their lives. So it depends whether it's just a straight off headshot or whether it's a mixture of headshots and on location. Okay. And um, you mentioned working occasionally with makeup artists and assistants. Um, I think maybe assistance with commercial shoots. Is, do you only use those for commercial shoots? And uh, do you always use those for commercial shoots? No, I don't always. Sometimes they say, so for, for Pogba, they went, I said, can I have an assistant, please? They went, no. Because <laughs> 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 no, I, like, oh. <laughs> I thought, oh, I needed moral support. And they said, well, we have our journalist, this wonderful woman who is the journalist, she can assist you. <laughs> So I was okay. getting her to assist me. So it depends. And I get a lot of people wanting to assist, but I'm not, some of the work I'm doing is quite intimate and I can't always have an assistant. Um, and, and so I, I'm always in, I've always got people that are wanting to assist, but generally it's for the bigger commercial shoots, like that big PR one. I needed somebody to just stand with me and to help set things up. So it's kind of a mixture. Okay. Um, when you were starting out, did you ever struggle with imposter syndrome when sharing your work? I still, I still, I still struggle with it. Honestly, I was, I was like, just what you need to do is embrace your imposter and give them a nice little home on your shoulder and just say, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to do it anyway. Do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um how do you agree fees especially with international contracts i again i look it up i i think i look at getty as well i get look at the getty calculator sometimes and i look at what you know what countries is it going to be what and, and the aop calculator so i make sure that they actually are really good. Publishers are generally really good at approaching you if they're going to use your work because they know they they have to have a license to use it. Other people aren't so great. So I kind of, I've worked out, you find out what the fee should be and you negotiate with them. Okay, yeah, because somebody, um, somebody said they're worried that they're undercharging clients and usually you can find oh, yeah. somebody who will give you some advice or guidance somewhere. Yeah, I think, I, you know, interesting. I think I did have a, it wasn't there. I had a slide, I must've got rid of it, which says, you know, portfolio building, but don't 
sell yourself off too cheaply. <laughs> so mm -hmm. obviously, if you're learning, it's different. But at the same time, there's a value to what you do. Um, I am. It's money is always we always find money difficult, don't we? So I think what you have to realize is that you just have to be straight and say my day's fee for a commercial piece of work is this, you know, or my day's fee for a private commission is this. And if people want to work with you, then they will pay that money or they will negotiate with you. Mm -hmm. I sometimes have done right. My fee is this, but I will do it for less. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Why did I do that? Why did I do yeah. that? Yeah. So you just have to, as you get more experience, then it's easier just to be, this is what it costs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, do you ever approach people or organizations that you're interested in working with? And if so, how do you make that approach? Gosh, I'm trying to think whether I do. You know, I have talked to organizations who... I love what they do, and I think what I do is resonant with what they do, and therefore I'm looking at can we work together on things, and sometimes that comes in the form of they might want to sponsor me because they like the story of the work that I'm telling. Um, so for, for personal projects I do, for commercial work I don't, but I think people should. I think if you're interested in working for NGOs or you're interested in working for charities, then um, you make sure that you have your work really beautifully put on your website and then you put a PDF together and you like I was talking about how you get your work out there in terms of press and publicity, put a PDF together and approach and say, I would love to talk with you. They may not have the work at this point, but maybe later on they will and they will remember you. Yeah um networking i was going to suggest that you know the two degrees of separation you, you sometimes it's it's always worth looking on facebook and linkedin and places because you think oh hang on they, we've got a mutual friend or i know that person and you have a word with them and they might have gone to school together or you know yeah. they may work together or something like that but introductions can go quite a long way they really can and they've really helped me you know when i've been introduced to people because of the work that I'm doing, because because the person has felt that this person or organization might be interested in the work I'm doing, then then you have a shared conversation. Um, and I know everybody feels a bit, not everyone, a lot of people feel awkward about networking. So you're finding shared ground and you're finding a way to kind of hear each other and communicate with, with each other with networking not to get something the thing is often people think it's about getting something from somebody else it's not it's about communicating it's about sharing and it's about working together yeah okay after providing the agreed number of images you said 20 or 40 how do you deal with requests to see the rest of your image it's happened to this person more than once and it's really annoying Really annoying. Just say you haven't got them. <laughs> so it is really annoying, and it 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 it's you just tell them. I think be very clear in your consultation with them that you select. I mean, forty images a whole lot of images to select from. That you select however many images for them to view, and the other images will be the out of focus. Will be the ones that aren't strong enough. I do understand the pain this person might be going through, but I think you just need to be straight with them. And also what I do say to people, because I, you know, when I'm taking portraits, a lot of people tell me, you will never photograph anyone as unphotogenic as me. And then I will say to them, I don't want you to worry about that. I'm your photographer. My job is to work with you to create a powerful portrait. You may never like that portrait because maybe you just don't like pictures of yourself. I don't always like pictures of myself, but let's enjoy the experience together so that your memory of this, making this portrait together is positive. And that, that helps quite a lot. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite lens for portraiture? So we used to always be the 85 1.4 Nikon lens. Um, it is now the 50 1.2 Z lens, which is phenomenal. 
but also I quite like the 24 to 70 which I would never I used to always been a prime lens person now I'm not, I I mix it up a little bit but I would say for portraits I love wide I love uh, wide aperture fast lenses good glass it's worth investing in your camera doesn't have to be great but your lens if you've got a great lens it can make all the difference um, what website do you use to send clients the photos? Okay, I use Pixieset, um, which I've just used for a long time. And I just use it privately to share their shoot with them and for them to select. And then I either make those selections, I either retouch the selections. Generally, I don't. Generally, they're kind of as they should be. Or I then... Um, prep the photos because it depends what they want to use do they want to use it for what kind of is it a private commission do they want them printed do they want them as digital downloads I then I, I then sometimes just send their favorites to via we transfer okay. and um, someone would love to know what you use for your audio recordings because it's something they'd love to offer but you've got no idea how to edit sound okay so I'm using the cheapest Zoom recorder with a lav mic and a dead cat, as they call it, which is a fluffy thing you put on it. I have used my phone before, but I edit. So I'm working, I'm editing with Reaper, R-E-A-P-E-R, -E -E which is actually really good. There is audacity, but I think Reaper is better um, in order to like equalize. And there's loads of uh, tutorials on YouTube for Reaper as well. So I'm using that for um for the uh, hardy and free and um i'm also working with somebody who does a lot of sound editing to make sure just a day or so to make sure that the levels are all even with all the interviews and the ambience okay that's good and when you're using a mic technically say a love mic get it nice and close to the person's mouth so you they're the most dominant thing Definitely. And also the other thing with lav mics, sometimes check your levels, <laughs> just check your levels. It's not over loud or it's not too quiet. And also if they're gesticulating a lot or going like that, or, you know, you have to be careful. They don't touch the lav mic. Okay. Good advice. Um, how long is your exhibition at the Bronte Parsonage Museum open? Do you know it's open until January? It's not wow. long. I'm a bit terrified at the moment because, yeah. you know, it's like in that stage where I haven't even properly finished the work, but it's actually open until from May till January. Fantastic. Great. Well, yeah. hopefully some of us will be able to go and see it. I'd love to. I hope uh, so. What was your most nerve wracking commission to date? I think the port, the um, Phoenix works the F women at phoenix works reimagining of that mm -hmm. was pretty terrifying because it's way out of my comfort zone and also because they were then going to have a proper opening of the picture at a big prestigious venue and i was thinking oh, this could be go so badly wrong and it involved that we only had i could do a recce but then i thought I'd never met the people before. We only had like three hours to do that. So that was pretty nerve wracking. But I'm kind of, that was full of terror. But it was fine. When I'm there, I kind of go into a different zone. I just have to problem, problem solve and get on with it. Yeah, yeah. But things like, because there was lots of people in that shot and then you've got several lights and you're sort of thinking, where are all the highlights? Where are all the shadows? How many shadows yeah. has everybody got? Eight, <laughs> eight lights, eight wow. lights. Wow. And, wow. Um, and then trying to make sure that everybody understood what they were doing and kind of communicating in a way that was engaging for people it's a lot of people to manage when you're curate, creating that kind of work okay what inspires you most in terms of personal projects it seems a little old hat to ask what is your muse but um what could really excite you about a new project and how do you um, make space to pursue it so at the moment i'm kind of in some ways i'm doing work that's commissioned that feels like personal work so that's really nice but new projects um they suddenly come to me sometimes like being in between came to me as almost like a fully formed idea mm -hmm. i didn't know it was going to do or be what it was um it's usually things that 
I'm really interested in exploring and I'm really wanting to find out more about and I have a, things I have a personal connection with and finding time there's never time there is never time you just have to kind of sneak it in <laughs> yeah and I, I I don't know about you but I find you know when you say if you're working on something and it's a real passion project then it's really hard not to do it. I don't have the time because I should be doing stuff that is going to pay the bills, but I just can't not do the other thing. Yeah. And always, always like that's, it's always like that. And I think the ideal is when you start getting work that is like the personal work and then it becomes more like pleasure. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So this is the last question. Um, do you ever shoot, you shoot digital, don't you? Or do you ever shoot film? I do shoot digital, but I do sometimes um, go back to film mm -hmm. and uh, I, I use film to slow down. And I think I, I, I use films really expensive, but I love I do love film. I use it to slow down. I use it when I'm wanting to kind of create work that's considered that's unexpected. And uh, I think I always bring a film like quality and my work's quite slow unless mm -hmm. Actually, my work is slow, unless it's Bloomberg, in which case, <laughs> unless it's like a commission for an editorial or something like that, and I have to work entirely differently. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I do sometimes shoot film. Um, do you, when you're shooting film, do you still sometimes look at the back of the camera? I'm it's trying to think whether I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think whether I do or not. It's called chimping, isn't it? Yeah. So you just automatically. <laughs> I, I will now. next time. Next time I take my film camera out, I'll I'll check. <laughs> I'll, I'll check to see whether I'm looking at the back. That's so quite one, funny. So one question has just popped in. Um, how do you cope if a commercial commission changes the brief? Or is that what happened? I'm trying to think whether it's happened. Whether they, you know, sometimes people add things on because mm -hmm. they're being cheeky they're like oh and whilst you're here could you do 50 headshots you know it's like mm -hmm. no so i i think if you feel it has implications on time and quality then you need to be very clear about that because it's really difficult for you and just say i would be very happy to deliver extra let's book in another day but i guess changing the brief it's never happened as in you've been uh, you've been booked to do something and they suddenly say can you do something else um I would talk to them and I would it, I would really think about how I felt about it right okay uh so that is the last of the questions but there are lots of people on Facebook and here saying thank you very much very inspirational talk they really enjoyed it one particularly oh, okay. nice one um, great webinar. I'm sat here starstruck as always with Carolyn. We'll definitely be watching this again and making lots of notes. So that's great to hear. Oh, Some that's really lovely because I have to tell, share with everyone. I so struggle with lots of things. I love doing the talking, but it's like thinking about how I'm going to do this talk. I took forever putting that presentation, even, even up to the last kind of hour. I was thinking, should I put that in? Should I take that out? But um, mm. I'm really appreciative of that, those positive comments. I'm so happy. And if anyone's got any questions, put them on Facebook or, or whatever on, underneath, and I will see if I can answer any more. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, it's been a, a really nice, uh, well, been a really nice evening listening to what you have to say. So thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to have been invited and appreciative of Nikon's support as well. And yeah, everyone, go for it. Just push your boundaries <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, then. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.